Conspiracy theorists claim that Tony Tucker was murdered because he had stolen the proceeds of an armed robbery that a man named Patsy Boltois Clark had allegedly organised. So let me say first, I have not seen any evidence whatsoever supporting this claim, but some people do claim that they've got it. The claim, we are told, was made by a guy named Billy Jasper. Billy Jasper was raised in Canning Town, which is like a tough working class area in the east end of London. Like every town, village and city in the UK and beyond, Canning Town had an established mature group of hard men villains and a much younger group of kind of up and coming hard men villains. This group had several men who went on to become sort of household names. You know, people like Vic Dark, Billy Gale, aka Jesse Gale, now sadly deceased, and a guy called Dean who features heavily in Jasper's and the conspiracy theorist story. Mr. D, they call him. So as these lads matured, many of them went on to form the Intercity Firm, the ICF, which is the name of West Ham United sort of football hooligan element. These guys were prominent figures around Canning Town when Billy Jasper was growing up, so he either knew them personally or knew of them. Um, how did you first come into contact with... Billy Gale first. Not in years, eh? Yeah. School ball, football, football. Like, what connection did you make to football? Did you just go buy a Uh, a month ago. What about Dean? Uh, how long did uh, Unfortunately for Billy, he developed a Class A drug habit, which had a huge effect on his life, his relationship with people and his personality. I am not in any way suggesting that Billy is or was a bad person. On the contrary, 30 years ago, he was in a bad place. He was the victim of an awful addiction. Rather than me talk about a guy I know very little about personally, here is Richie Reynolds, a former Essex villain who served time with Billy Jasper after he falsely confessed to transporting an alleged assassin to Rettenden on the night Tucker, Tate and Rolf were murdered. It was about 1996, because it was, um, I, think I remember the exact date as it happened, it was February the 13th, 1996, I got kicked out of High Point. Right, I got kicked out of there to Wayland. That's where I met Billy Jasper, that's where he was on that uh, thing as well. So he, I don't know where he'd come from, but he was, he was another one, because they put us onto Sea Wing, and Sea Wing was like Skid Row in Wayland at the time. There was for lifers and people who were being shipped about the bit, you know what I mean? Nuisance people, really. And uh, I was only on there for fighting, sort of thing. They kicked me out for fighting in Wayland at night point. But um, he had done what he'd been doing. So he might be a nice fella outside. He wasn't that bad a fella, to be honest. No, I wasn't really pally with him, but he was on the same spur as me, because there was like eight cells on the spur. We was upstairs on Sea Wing. I think it was D spur we was on. But um, he used to come round and he'd go, oh, I was having some sort of uh, jokes here, licky jokes. And I used to go, I'll keep that big awful fuck there, freaking you know, up. Yeah, that betite us and everything. But so a lot of people in jail, they get um, turning the junkies or whatever in jail, but I don't know what he's like outside. No fit state to do what he reckons he'd done in when I see him. I mean, I've heard of things that he's supposed to have said he's done and this and that after, but he never said anything there, to be honest. Like, if he would have been bragging about that, he would have been bragging about it in there. Yeah, he was just on that shit before the fucking thing. Well, the piss tests weren't even about it. he was. But he was just like, uh, a lot of people become prison junkies. Outside, they're decent. I don't know what his life's like outside, though, to be fair. So that he was a long-term user for the way his body was. So he wasn't just someone who's just done it in prison, do you know what I mean? So it's probably, it's probably a bit of a daft question, but if he... Um was going to tell you something for his benefit. Yeah. Would you consider him to be credible? <laughs> Never in a million years. <laughs> Never in a million years. He was one of them people. He, he was doing it. I mean, he's one of them. When they get down a certain road, they do anything just to try and get out and get their things. I mean, even if he's in themselves, I reckon he'd probably just try and even confess to anything, just get banged up even in prison, they can get out of it. Please still, couldn't you? So you want to get out of there as quick as you can. So when they're on them fixes, if they think, fuck, I'm fucked anyway, he probably, I think they're saying everything just fucking, you know what they're like. Yeah, fucking. yeah. It was a, and then later on, I heard he'd been confessing to this and that, and I thought, fucking hell. But he never said nothing there. So I think he was going to, what was he bragging about it later on when I met him just after them things happened, really? 
Oh, if he was going to break about it, he might have been going on about it then, but he never really... And when he used to come and sit in myself, I think, oh, fuck off, but... You know, like, when you're in there, you can't really tell something. We all got to live together, innit? Yeah. He, he wasn't too bad a fellow, really. He's just down on his luck all the time. And oh. he went, fuck all, the state of his fucking cell. God, mate. One of them people, but... As I say, you got to live with them, so he was just one of them ones who got past by. He had a kind of enough heart, really. But then again, people were saying, walking in their cell, just taking stuff when they weren't there and stuff like that. Never come across as a bully or nothing like that. It wasn't like that. He'd always see the bitch. He'd say, you're in my cell. They go, oh, yeah, sorry, I'll grab this. Or I'll grab... He wasn't one of them ones who just deny it and fucking... Yeah, he wasn't like a Peter thief. He, just, he was just like a fucking... Just a piss taker more than anything. That's why I think he got kicked out of the other jail, probably, just for being a nuisance. So let's just paint the picture here. Billy has a Class A drug habit that needs to be fed. In January 96, he is arrested for an unrelated offence to the Rettendon murders and is in custody at an East End police station. He craves drugs, and so he either needs to get released or be remanded into prison. So either way, both those situations, he can feed his habit, whether he's on the street or whether he's in jail. So Billy Jasper is on record stating that he told the police this story concerning the Rettendon murders so he could get a deal, get out of the police station or get a lesser sentence. Billy knew that if he was to get his deal, he would have to give the police useful information. Imagine you go to buy a car. You say to the guy, I'll give you a grand. He'll go, no. I'll give you two grand. No. I'll give you three grand. No, you'll have to do better than that. And that's what it was like with Billy. He started off giving them little bits of info to get his deal, and they're going, no, you've got to give us more. You've got to give us more. He threw more names in of well-known people. He just built it all up, hoping to get this deal. It was all bullshit, but he just kept throwing the names in. It was pointless, Billy saying to the police, my postman did it, or some really Mr. Clean guy who works in the library. The police were never going to buy that. He had to give them the names of notorious, well-known people. According to the conspiracy theorists, and allegedly Billy, he picked up a car fitted with false number plates from a well-known individual named Bowers at a gym in the East End. It was the Peacock Gym. This, according to the conspiracy theorists, was driven to and from the murder scene by Jasper. Regardless of whoever made this claim, I say it is total and absolute nonsense. And I say that for these reasons. One, there isn't a shred of independent evidence to support their claims. Two, the Bowers brothers are for all intentions and purposes part of the Wombs family. Jack Wombs was one of the men convicted of the murders. And according to John Wombs, who was often referred to the Bowerses as his cousins, His parents raised the Bowers brothers. So, can you imagine the Bowers brothers watching Jack Wombs and his mother suffer for 25 years if they knew Jasper was in fact involved or indeed responsible for the murders? It wouldn't happen. They wouldn't allow that to happen to members of their family. So, ridiculous does not begin to describe such a claim. It's nonsense. So. Billy's set his stall out. He's picked a crime that had been all over the news for a month prior to his arrest. He's picked the names of the most notorious people he knew to blame. All he had to do now was join the dots. And then maybe, just maybe, he might get his deal. The conspiracy theorists claim that Jasper told the police the motive for the murders was the proceeds of an armed robbery going missing which Tony Tucker had been given to launder. Okay, so there's been a robbery. Someone's given Tucker the proceeds of the robbery to launder. According to these people, Tucker had received 300 grand to launder through his clubs, but he failed to invest it or return it. Anybody who gives Tony Tucker 300 grand seriously needs some professional help. It just wouldn't happen. The man they say had planned the robbery, Patsy Boltise Clark, had then ordered Tucker's execution in revenge for the money going missing. The problem with that claim is, when the robbery was committed in October 1989, Tony Tucker did not, I I underline that, did not run or control any nightclubs whatsoever. He was simply employed as a doorman. Michael Kelly, who worked with Tucker at the time, has good cause to remember the dates and the details. According to Michael, at the time of the robbery, Tucker was working for him at Hollywood's Romford. 
the security contract was being renewed and Michael assumed that he would secure it because he was running it and he thought he would just carry on. Tucker being Tucker had been taking the new manager out for meals, taking him horse riding and managed to snatch the contract from under Michael's nose. So he did what he always did, you know, pulled the manager up, taking him out, oh, give me the contract, give me the contract. And the manager obviously did. So understandably, Michael says he fell out with Tucker over it. Regardless, Tucker did not run any club prior to or at the time of the robbery. Not according to me, but according to the very people he worked with at the time, i.e. Michael Kelly. So that theory is bullshit, right? Another problem with Billy Jasper's story is the fact he kept changing it. The conspiracy theorists constantly try to fool those who listen to him by saying, oh, he never changed his story. It was consistent. It didn't change to any degree. That is absolute rubbish. Totally false. Misleading. It's, in fact, a lie, a blatant lie, right? Look at Jasper claiming the motive for the murders was the proceeds of an armed robbery going missing, which Tony Tucker had been given to launder. So that's quite a big statement, right? That's the motive. And then compare that to a Daily Mail article written by Joanne Goodwin and titled The Cossidy Supergrass or something like that. It was published on the 2nd of August 1999 and in it Goodwin claims Billy Jasper told police that he was having a drink at a bar called Morton's and a discussion took place regarding a drug deal that they were about to do with Tucker. Gail had allegedly been ripped off on a previous deal with Tucker and so they all agreed that they would rob and kill him. Does that sound like proceeds of a robbery? No. So Jasper's story is one million percent inconsistent. That's just one example. It proves 100% that Jasper's evidence was far from consistent. What is true, there was a robbery that did take place at the time, date and place the conspiracy theorists claim. I actually know some of the people involved. Patsy Boltai's clerk, I assure you, is a red herring. He did not organise it, nor did he or anybody else give Tony Tucker any money to launder. These are the facts of that particular robbery. I'll tell you the facts of it now, right? When I first met Tony Tucker, he had confided in me that he was the subject of a particularly damaging and dangerous rumour. He said, if I heard an allegation that he was a grass, I should ignore it, as the guy making the claim was full of shit. Those were his words, right? It transpired that one or two of the doormen who worked alongside Tucker at Hollywoods in Romford were calling him a grass. Not unusual in the door world. They all call each other grasses. There's more bitching goes on in that world than there does in beauty pageants. Several of their friends were repeating the allegation and Tucker clearly feared that people would start thinking that there's no smoke without fire. And that's a kind of normal reaction in my eyes. The truth is, in late September 1989, Dave Corston, a doorman who worked with Tucker at Hollywoods, was stopped in a stolen Jaguar and arrested by the robbery squad. It was alleged that Corston had stolen the vehicle earlier for use in a robbery. Evidence was later disclosed that the person who provided the information that led to Corston's arrest was his mother. Mrs Corston had spoken to a police officer who was a family friend because she was concerned about her son being in possession of a stolen vehicle. All mums would be, wouldn't they? Mrs Corston had either heard conversations or simply surmised that the vehicle was going to be used in the near future for a robbery. For whatever reason, she thought that's what they got the car for. The officer, unsurprisingly, passed the information to his colleagues. DS Hughes was assigned to speak to Mrs Corston, who is reported to have been distressed throughout their interview, throughout their conversation. Shortly after that interview, Dave Corston was arrested in possession of the stolen Jaguar. With me so far? On the 4th of October 1989, gunmen hijacked a security van in Whalebone Lane, Dagenham and forced guards to drive to an isolated area in Epping Forest. Hijacked probably isn't an accurate description of what happened because the driver of the security van, a man named John Aitken, was an associate of the robbers. The driver of the van knew the robbers, okay? Aitken had stopped at a newsagent, contrary to company regulations, and a man with a gun had appeared. Aitken and his co-worker, who knew nothing of the robbery, were ordered to drive to Epping Forest, which was approximately 12 miles away. It was alleged that Dave Redwing, who worked at Hollywoods with Tucker and Corston, and another man, Roger Berkeley, then arrived in a red Ford van. This van belonged to Berkeley. The gang had sort of decided to go ahead with the robbery, uh, in spite of Corston's arrest and the loss of the Jaguar. 
Aitken's colleague was bound to a tree with tape whilst Aitken was ordered to run into the forest and keep running. The robbers stole approximately 495 grand, call it 500 grand, half a million quid, before making their getaway. Seven months later, Redwin and Berkeley were arrested when they arrived home from a Spanish holiday. As Berkeley was being driven to Barking Police Station, he put his head in his hands and asked a detective, can you just tell me one thing, who grasped us? Berkeley did not get a reply, but the obvious suspect was Dave Corston or a member of his family. He'd been nicked a week or so before, so it's natural to think, I'll bet he's grasped us. But I must add, Dave Corston had not assisted the police in any shape or form. No way. The unusual circumstances surrounding his arrest at the time naturally created suspicion. So when detectives asked where the stolen money was, Redwin, this is on the way back to the police station, in the van, it was all recorded, written down. When detectives asked where the stolen money was, Redwin had laughed and replied, it's all spent. So they'd spent all the money, wasted. So definitely not stolen by Tucker, according to the people who did the robbery. On the 25th of April 1991 at Chelmsford Crown Court, Dave Corston was sentenced to six years. Dave Redwin, Roger Berkeley, and John Aitken, the driver of the security van, were all sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. In December 1992, Redwin, Berkeley, and Aitken were all freed after successfully appealing against their conviction. During their trial, Crown Prosecution Service had asked the judge if they could cross-examine DSUs in order to try and establish that the reason for Mrs. Corston's distress was not simply and solely that her son was in possession of a stolen car, but that stolen car was likely to be used in a security van robbery, thus seeking, via the mother's evidence, to link her own son directly to the crime. So what they were trying to do, they were trying to say to Mrs. Corston, right, we know your son's got a stolen car, but do you think it was linked to this robbery? He was going to use it in the robbery. And she was all upset and crying, and God knows what she said, but they were asking her to basically read her son's mind, or if he might have said something, but they were pressuring her to link her son to the robbery. Do you understand that? That's what they were doing. I mean, I don't know which police officer was in charge of all this, but um, it's pretty shabby business, really, uh, taking that route, because it's hearsay, isn't it? doesn't matter what his mother says or what she thinks. It's not evidence. Not, not, not in a court at all, it's not. And here's the proof of that. That proposed line of re-examination was objected to by the defence. So at the trial, the defence went, you can't ask her that. But the judge said, no, they can. And he allowed it to proceed. Mrs. Corston's evidence was littered with hearsay and assumptions. And so it should never have been allowed, as I've just said. The convictions were therefore overturned at an appeal. So all of them got out at appeal because of the police messing it up, basically. Seven months later, Corston was also released following an appeal on the very same grounds. Dave Redwin had blamed Corston for their arrests, but Corston was adamant police version of events had been invented to protect an informant. So he was going, it weren't my mom, someone's grasped us, someone's grasped us. So the obvious question is, who? So that informant, according to Dave Corston, was Tony Tucker. And Tucker was questioned about this robbery, but Corston was adamant that Tucker had grasped him. That's what he said. On Monday, the 29th of June, 2009, Dave Corston emailed me first and then he rang me up, right? He said, I need to see you, Bernie. I, I really need to. I, I want to talk about Tony Tucker. <laughs> he sounded pretty desperate, so I said, OK, no problem. We met at a cafe in Wickford High Street, Essex, and Dave told me the story of the robbery. He said that Tucker had been involved, not physically, but behind the scenes, OK? Whatever that means, that's what he said. A difference of opinion had taken place between Tucker and one of the robbers. And so, for spite allegedly, Tucker had grasped him. This is what Dave says. I didn't believe or disbelieve Dave. I had no way of knowing the truth. And so up until now, I have never mentioned our meeting or what was discussed between us. But I'm mentioning it now because of this nonsense, okay? Understandably, Dave Corston wanted to not only clear his name, but he wanted people to know his well-meaning mother had not acted maliciously. I get that. Mrs. Corston had simply asked a family friend who happened to be a policeman to look out for her son as she feared that he was going to get himself into trouble. I believe, this is my personal thoughts, Dave Corston struggled with the thought of being falsely accused or the fact his mother had been used to present hearsay and assumption as evidence against him and his friends. So it kind of done his head in what the police had done to his mother, do you know what I mean? I say he struggled with it because the next time I heard of Dave 
was when he featured in an evening news bulletin. At 9am on Friday the 6th of May 2011, Dave Causton had dialed 999 and told the operator that he had barricaded himself inside his home with two other people. When asked why, Causton had said that he felt he had been ignored by the authorities for years and was not being taken seriously by them. He explained his frustration at his position of having information about several sensitive matters to do with the criminal justice system. He just wanted someone in authority to listen to what he had to say. Moments later, armed police were taking up positions in the quiet street where Dave lived near Norwich. During the siege that followed, Causton put documents in a folder on top of his garden shed and told the police to take them, some of those documents related to Tucker. Right? But when an armed unit attempted to storm his back garden to retrieve the folder or get in his house, nobody knows what, police spotters believe they saw a man at a window with a gun and they withdrew. Negotiators spent hours talking to Dave and a man and a woman who were inside the house voluntarily. They weren't hostages. At one stage, David appeared at the front door and shouted at police, fill me full of fucking bullets. Obviously, not in a very good frame of mind. Rather than storm the house, police took the decision to let Dave calm down or satisfy himself that his grievance had been heard. So they thought, just let him have his rent and then we'll call it a day, right? Nick him. The following afternoon, Dave rang the Sun newspaper and said, I could gun them, talking about the police, down. Look at what Raoul Moat done to them. I'm not joking. The reporter, always keen for the story, asked Dave if he felt like Raoul Moat. Raoul Moat's the guy who killed his ex-girlfriend's boyfriend, Chris Brown, and he blinded a policeman, PC David Rathbun, who also sadly later died. Dave allegedly responded angrily by shouting at the reporter, no, I fucking don't, mate. If I were to go roving, I'd make him look like a fucking fairy. I'd go and get a couple of Mac-10s and do a Terminator. I'm judging by that, he wasn't very happy. The standoff came to an end 36 hours after it had started, when a woman holding a puppy left the house shortly followed by another man. These are the voluntary hostages. They were led away by officers. Dave emerged moments later, but he totally ignored the police and he walked straight across a grassed area opposite his home. Armed officers were pointing their guns and shouting at him. Armed police, put your hands above your head and get down, police. Causton had only walked about 10 paces when one of the officers shot him in the back with a taser. Dave momentarily froze, his head jerked back and he fell to the ground. Approximately eight officers then jumped on top of him and put him in cuffs as he lay incapacitated on the ground. Dave had no shoes on and was only wearing shorts. As Dave was led away by the officers, he was still shouting about the injustice he had suffered. When Dave eventually appeared at Norwich Crown Court, he admitted two counts of possessing an air pistol with intent to cause fear or violence and was sentenced to three years imprisonment. So, there you have it. Tucker couldn't possibly have laundered any money through clubs because he wasn't running any clubs. That's fairly convincing. The robbery came about because one of the guys working on the security van knew one or more of the robbers. They planned it between them. No, Patsy Boltise Clark, planning it, involved in it, rubbish. One of the most ridiculous claims being made about it being Tucker is the fact they're saying Tucker was given 300 grand to launder. The robbers only stole 495 grand. There was at least four people involved in the robbery. So if you give Tucker 300 grand, that leaves 50k each for the robbers. Really? So you need nearly 500 grand and someone gives you 50k and you go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> They're called robbers because they steal. I don't think they'd accept 50 grand, do you? Obviously, Boltise is bump paying as well, so it's even less than 50 grand. Obviously, the money's going to be laundered and then Tucker's going to want money and other people are going to want money. It's absolute bullshit. Ridiculous just doesn't even cover what they're claiming about this robbery. So, as usual, we shall uh, love you and leave you and uh, remind you, there's absolutely nothing to see here. Let's move on to the next one.